Hello there, everyone. It is I, Joey Graceffa, and I'm about to sit down with Tom for an Under the Influence interview. What and that's dog a, just that is a... Sitting here with Joey Graceffa. I said that right, correct? Yes, yes, you did. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> now, you are a YouTube personality, actor, author, producer, and singer, according to Wikipedia. Oh, gosh. Did they leave anything out? Mm, I'm sure there's a couple, but I feel like those are the main ones. You, I read, also brought male no- nail polish back. I mean, um, I... That's a pretty big honor. Yeah, so very the nice inventor nails. of males and nails. <laughs> Did you just make that up or is that a thing? That just came to me right now. Wow, it's just so creative. It's incredible. I want to start talking about Escape the Night because okay. you just got done with VidCon. Yeah. And VidCon, you're like a fucking uh, Greek god. I mean, you're draped all over the building. I know. It's Everywhere you so go, it's a picture weird. of Joey. It's cool. How does it feel? I mean, it's wild because I've been to every single VidCon. So the fact that oh, wow. like throughout the years I've I've been a part of it to now, like the past four years, my face being on the front of it every single year is wild. How has it changed, VidCon, from when, when you first went to now? I mean, it was definitely just, like, it started as, like, a place where you'd go to, like, just hang out with your friends because it's, like, a place for us all to, like, meet up. But mm-hmm. now that everyone lives in L.A., it's, like, you don't really get that feeling. You already know everybody. Yeah. So, and then it's also, like, more mainstream and a lot more, like, like professional in a way mm-hmm. where it just feels a lot more... I don't know, stiff. It's more, it's kind of corporate, right? Because you're there to work. Yeah. In case you don't know, if you've never been backstage at VidCon, these guys have meeting, 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 appearance, yeah. meeting, party, meeting. Even the party's a, a job, right? I got to yeah. show up at this studio's party. Exactly. If I don't, that's a bad thing. Yeah. Your PR guy over here, Paul, is probably like, you got to go to this one. <laughs> but I don't want to go to this one, but you got to go, trust me, because someone's going to be there. That's pretty much how your, yeah, your week looks, it's all, right? It's very busy. Okay. How's this season going? So you're season four. You were four or five episodes in yep. when this airs. Yep. Um, so what's been going on? It's just so exciting. I mean, it's my favorite thing I get to do currently. So it's like I just pour so much of my creativity into it and to see it come to life and the audience be so invested in the story and just the show itself. Like there's so many conspiracy videos, people reacting to it. It's just like... It's so cool to create something that people love and like want to have more depth to. Do you watch those? Do you watch like the fan I do. videos? Yeah. What are what's a conspiracy video? Like, There's so many. But like, what does that even mean? Okay, so it's it's the whole show is all connected through the seasons. Mm-hmm. So it's not just like a classic reality show where each season is just like fully reset. There's like a linear line that's also of a storyline that's continuing throughout the show. So. People are just kind of speculating of how things are connected. Like, for instance, in season one, there was a hand that shows up in the first or second episode that has this cool tattoo. Mm -hmm. And then in season three, the person who's helping us throughout the season has that same tattoo on her arm. So is it the same person, or are people asking? Well, yeah, that's that's the conspiracy. (laughs) That's the conspiracy. Is that the same arm? Um, So little things like that, but also people just like, are into, like, the classic reality aspect of, like, who's going to be voted off when. Mm -hmm. And Do people bet on it? Because people bet on reality Uh, shows now, like The Bachelor. I don't know. Who's going to win? Oh, yeah, that's a thing. There's a lot of, like, videos that are just based off of, like, the order that they think. I don't think anyone's gotten it yet. That's pretty hard. The odds have got to be a million, like, millions to one that you're actually going to (laughs) get. There's so many different combinations. Yeah. So who do you have this season? Who's on? Um, We have... Nine other YouTubers. We have Bertman Rock. We have Colleen Ballinger, Love Tana Bradman. Mocho, Gabby Love Show. Um, Love Gabby. I Justine. Yeah. Day Storm, Timothy De La Ghetto. Who am I missing? Oh, Rosanna. Paisano? Pansino, yeah. No, Pansino. I can't pronounce mm-hmm. anyone's name, as you can tell. Yeah. So how do you get all these people? I mean, I know, consistently over the years, does it pay a lot? YouTube premium? It does not. Like, <laughs> my friends are doing it as, like, a favor, but also, like, it's it's a fun show. It's, like... I think they do it for the experience and also to, like, because I'm their friend. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I mean, there's great exposure from it. It's like a giant collaboration with 10 people. So audiences are mixing together. So everyone benefits, benefits from the yeah. show. And um, the fan base is so intense that... What's the demo? Like, what is the fan base? I would say it's like teenagers, young adults. Okay. Um, but there are definitely some, like, older people that enjoy the show as well. Sure. Um, but it's cool, like, the interactivity of, like, the fan art that gets made. And just, like, people are so engaged on social media that I find, like, a lot of my friends are like, oh, my God, like, the fans are, like, really into it. Like, all my tweets are full of Escape the Night fans. Yeah. So it just brings in a new audience for everyone. That's probably what you're most known for now, right? You I think, think so. You know, the books are New York Times bestsellers. You've done all this other stuff. You've got a successful YouTube yeah. channel. But this is, Joey is Escape the Night. Yeah. Right, pretty much now. Mm-hmm. What's, has anything crazy happened so far, you know, when you filmed the season? I mean, you've got Tana, who's a hot mess. Tana, I love you. <laughs> <She> <laughs> I really know her. Is. Bretman is a well, laugh riot. Speaking of Tana, she actually really surprised me this season. What do you mean? She, um, well, because it's an all-star season, so these are people who've already been on the show. Okay. It was, she was on two years ago, and she was a completely different person. She was just very, like, immature and just, like, like airy. And, I mean, she laughed back to Vegas when she was needed the next day <laughs> on set. And she, she arrived back, but it's, like, things like that. This year, was there a was, reason she went to Vegas or just I have no uh, idea. I go home and get a sandwich? Because sometimes Probably. she does that. So this year she was so professional, but also just with like the solving clues, we we definitely underestimated her. And there was this one point where <laughs> we were reading a clue and it was like all the words were backwards and we're like struggling so hard to like understand how to decipher like what this sentence says. She comes up over my shoulder and starts reading it just like as if she if you were reading it normal. Yeah. And I was like, what the hell? She like, just so power. shocked. She has a special power where she can read things backwards. Well, it was so funny because we were all so shocked because we all underestimate her. And we're like, oh, damn, I can't solve any clues. Like, <laughs> like in season two, there was the moment that we always laugh about where we were, we cameras cut and she finds this like blue post-it note that was just on like the equipment or something. And she's like, I found a clue. And we're like, girl, <laughs> That's the camera that, guy's post-it that's, note. Yeah, that's literally a post-it note. Like, the show's a little more classy like that. It's, like, all, like, Victorian <laughs> style, not just a blue post-it note. So that was a funny moment. So it, she really brought up the season. I love Tana. I kind of want to talk a little bit about, you know, going back. You know, that's kind of where we're at now. But kind of going back. You're from uh, Massachusetts. Yeah. Right? How far out, outside of Boston are you? That's always, it's like, like the, 45 minutes. Okay, so suburb of Boston. Yeah. And you've got... A little brother with autism, and you have an older sister. Yep. I was thinking, how severe is the autism? Um, Because it could be all over. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, he can't communicate properly, so he doesn't, like, speak normally. It's all kind of, like, mumbled, and there are some words to it, but it's not like you can have a full-on conversation with him. Does he get frustrated? Because I know that's tough, because he can't express himself, Yeah, absolutely. How was that growing up? Was How um, far apart are you guys in age? 15 years. Oh, okay. So yeah. were you more like an uncle kind of raising him or did you help out a lot Very around the house? Very much so. My mom was an alcoholic during this time, so she was like fully incapable of being a mom at that point. How bad? Um, I'm an alcoholic. I'm sober oh, okay. 14 years Saturday. Oh. Yeah. That's awesome. Is, is your mom sober now or is she no, still she's, working? I mean, currently right now she is, I think. Okay. Um, she's in like a rehab like slash like... Uh, I forget what, like, aftercare type place where she's with other recovering yeah, people. like a sober house. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I haven't seen her in a while, and I kind of have, like, a little bit of a distance right now with her. Mm-hmm. But as far as, like, that time, like, her and my stepdad were not in the best place. So he also was working all the time. So it kind of, like, fell on me to raise my little brother. Was your older sister around at the no, time? No, she, she out was, of the house? she was in college. Oh, so um, it was just you? Yeah. Wow. And so it was really difficult because I was like 16, 17, 18, like throughout these years of raising a autistic child. And I mean, I kind of maybe not want to have kids for a while because sure. I like, I feel like I missed out on a lot of just like getting to be like a teenager because I was so like, I had to watch him. I mean, I kind of enjoyed like watching like <laughs> the kid shows with him. <laughs> Like, past the age that I probably should have been watching, like, <laughs> Dora the Explorer and, like, okay. Spongebob and stuff. Um, Nothing wrong with Spongebob. Yeah. There's no age rage on that. I watch <laughs> yeah. it with my little daughter. I still okay. love it. Yeah. yeah. So, that gave me an excuse to watch those shows, which maybe is why I still have, like, this kid 
mentality of my creativity. Yeah. Was, did it kind of cut your, because that's a lot to lay on a 15-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? At that age, we'll talk about kind of getting bullied and trying to figure yourself out and trying to figure where you fit in this universe and all this other stuff and bullies and, but then you've got this additional responsibility. You know, when I was in high school, I just, I would came, come home and, you know, play basketball in the street or yeah, sure. do homework or watch The Simpsons and not really think about anyone else except for me. Yeah. But you had a constantly, you almost had another full-time job when you got home from school, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I had a lot of resentment and I was annoyed at the fact that that's what I had to do. Um, so I was, I was kind of like, lazy about it because I was like a teenager like I didn't want to be watching my little brother like I wanted to be going out and doing things and hanging with my friends and playing video games um but I still like made time for those stuff so it wasn't like I was just like a a teen dad or something <laughs> what kind of ki- what kind of kid were you were you like a loner I know you were in a theater were you a yeah. theater kid were you you know did you hang with I mean who'd you what kind of kid were you I was very shy, but I also had a lot of friends in, like, different sections. Only girls. I was terrified of the boys in my grade because I would always get made fun of by them. Would they make fun of you? Were you kind of different at that age? Yeah, I was very feminine, and I just liked more girly things. So I couldn't really connect with guys anyways because they wanted to, like, play sports and, like, be rough with each other. And Mm -hmm. I was, like, more of just, like, I want to... Talk. Yeah, and, like, just... (laughs) Be like the girls. Yeah. So that was kind of like a struggle throughout. But um, And then I also had my dad who was like the super like straight macho man who wanted me as like his straight son sure. to play sports and stuff. Um, so I also had that pressure on me. When did he give up on that dream? It, so it was in eighth grade. Okay, that, I got, the dream died in eighth grade? It did. It was like a total transformation with me and my dad because... I had gotten the lead role in my high school play, and I think him seeing me on stage in, like, something that I was passionate about and, like, just, and good like, at. yeah, and, like, the lead role of, like, something that he felt very proud of me in that sense, and he, like, totally never pushed me again to be a certain role. Oh, that's of, awesome. Yeah. So, that's good. Did you ever do therapy? I mean, this is a lot of yeah. childhood stuff. Yeah, going on for sure. The YouTube years. was actually my first therapy. Okay. I watched this girl, her name was Starbury17, uh, was, is, um, and she openly talked about her experience with an al- or not an alcoholic parent, a parent who suffered with drug addiction. Mm-hmm. And her opening up about that made me feel confident to open up about my story. So I did, and I, it was like my first time I'd ever spoken about it. Like, my friends didn't even know. It was just like, talking to a camera just was so easy and freeing for me. Which is bizarre. Right. Most people, I can have a conversation on a camera, I don't worry about the cameras, but just to look in a camera and talk is hard as fuck. Yeah. And especially about real personal stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very rare talent that 99% of people don't have. Yeah. So it was just, it was very freeing. And then from there, I learned a lot about like how important therapy was. And then I started seeing a therapist and I have, done other things to to help my mental state. Oh, okay. Yeah. What else do you do, if you don't mind talking about them? Because I'm sure a lot of your younger fans out there are being bullied or going through shit, you know, feel different. I think do it's you recommend just, anything else? Well, I think it's also just kind of allowing yourself to feel those emotions and not to, like, suppress them. Megan, Server 17, she also taught me. We were on The Amazing Race together. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we had to learn to communicate with each other during that process. And I was, I think... 20, 20 at that time. And so she taught me a lot of like about expressing yourself, expressing your feelings and your emotions because when you have an emotion that's that's real, like your feelings are real and they're valid and it's important to express to that person if they're hurting your feelings or like what's going on because if you hold it in, then it just leads to a Resentment. Lot. And, yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. Mm-hmm. Were you, so you've got all this going on. When did you start shooting YouTube videos? I was 15. So you were, you were in high school? Yeah, I was in high school. What kind of stuff? I mean, what inspired you to even start? Because YouTube wasn't really a big thing. Yeah, 2007. Thing. Um, yeah, there really it just began. I think there was like this girl who lived in Massachusetts. Her name was Brookers. She was like one of the first big YouTubers. And she just made these funny skit videos that like I was already making like home videos kind of like that. 
And so I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Like there's people commenting on it. She's getting like people to to view her stuff. Like I want to do that. Yeah. So I, I started with my friend Brittany and uh, she was my best friend and we just decided to start our channel together. What kind of content were you making? We started with a stop motion video that took like so long to make. <laughs> It was called Humanation. It was like literally our bodies moving in a stop motion. Mm -hmm. And then we started going into like skits and parodies and then music video parodies. And then I eventually left that channel and started my Joey Grisafa channel. Mm -hmm. And what was the response to, to that early stuff? I mean, it sounds like you guys weren't fucking around. I mean, you had yeah. you had a real plan, and we're not just going to wing it. And hey, guys, hey guys, like and subscribe. So this no, is my day. No, we we had strategy. We would comment on other people's pages and be like, hey, if you like this channel, check out our channel. Mm -hmm. um, we would really just like try and like get the word out there. And then as far as like what type of content we were posting, we learned what worked well. Like becoming like a parody channel, we saw that taking like a, a pop culture event with a, a big musical artist like mm -hmm. Justin Bieber at the time had just like popped off and then Farmville I don't know if you remember that Facebook yeah. game was a big thing as well so we combined those two you things. You get those annoying notifications so and so invites you to play Farmville. Okay yeah, yeah. All those? yeah. Mm -hmm. So we combined like the Justin Bieber one time song with Farmville parody lyrics and it was those two combinations that brought in such a different audience that were like, oh, this is this is something. Like, there's this is a game you mm -hmm. have to play. Yeah. And we learned early how to play the YouTube game. And you won. Sort of, yeah. Yeah. I what, mean it's what was it's the still growth like? A con constant, it's a constant game, it's right? Constant you never game. win the game, I guess. Very tiring game. <laughs> <laughs> well, when did you kind of burn out from that? Because you're doing that was were you daily vlogging at that time too? So no, I wasn't daily vlogging. That actually led to daily vlogging. I okay. got burnt out of the music videos. Okay. And I started doing the daily vlogs and I just fell in love with that. It was like that's when my channel really started growing a lot quicker was because I was connecting with an audience and sharing my life. And so What was it like before? Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. what was it like before when you were doing your parodies? Like how many followers did you have versus when you started? So vlogging? we got up to like two hundred thousand followers oh. on that channel. And then I quit, moved to my channel, and started daily vlogging. And it was after like maybe four months of that, I went from 500,000 to 2 million oh, wow. in like six months. Wow. And then from there, it just snowballed into like quickly, quickly gaining a huge audience. Wow. How did you wrap your head around that? I mean, were you, so how old are you at the time when you were daily vlogging? Um, 20. Okay. So you out of the house at the time? Like, what's your living situation like? I moved out of, from Massachusetts to LA when I was 19. Okay. Um, we drove cross country and... Who, who'd you come out with? With my best friend, oh, okay. Brittany, who we started that channel together. Mm -hmm. And then after about a year of being in LA, I, I left and started my own channel. Okay. And so at the time, were you, I mean, making money and you're supporting yourself? I mean, yeah. it's, it's always like a only kids can kind of do that, right? Yeah. I'm going to go out to LA and make it because any reasonable person when they're older goes, okay, you know, where's my 401k? Where's right. my health insurance? You know, where's the next paycheck coming from? For sure. Did you already have brand deals and stuff before? No, it was, we had $5,000 saved combined. Okay. And we had first and last month's rent down and then we had a couple thousand to like spend and stuff. Okay. Um, but, and we we're making like a thousand to two thousand a month. and Off we, YouTube. Yeah. And so, I don't know if you know Maker Studios. They were yeah. like the first MCN. So Lisa Nova approached us at the first VidCon, and she was like, hey, we'd love to take a meeting with you. And I was like, oh my God, this is like my, my favorite YouTuber. She wants to take a meeting with me. What the hell? Yeah. So we met with her, and she's like, I'm starting this MCN company, which at the time I was Wait, like, she was a YouTuber? Yeah. That started? Oh, I, I never knew that story. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so she's like, I'm creating this. Uh, MCN, which we didn't know what, what that was. What's like, an MCN? Yeah, because at the time there was this channel called The Station, which was this collection of YouTubers who all collaborated together on one specific channel, and it was like this great way of growing your audience because it was cross promotion. And so we're like, oh my god, we're going to join the station, we're going to gain all these subscribers. So literally, I dropped out of college. We drove cross country at 19 years old, with just like we're going to go join Maker, yeah, and see what happens. Mm -hmm. 
And so we just did, and we took the risk, and it, it paid off. Yeah. Do you think, I always ask people this, right? Because especially when you start early like that, like I asked Timothy De La Ghetto, I interviewed him last week, yeah. and said this, asked him the same thing. If you were starting out now in 2019 in Massachusetts, do you think you'd be successful as quickly as you were then? Because there's so much more competition, the game's changed so much. Do you right. think you could no, still get through? Personally, me, yeah. yes, I think I could. Okay. Um, but it, I think in general, it's a lot more uh, difficult yeah. to, to gain an audience. But I think I would still find success. Yeah. What, um, so you're out here in L.A., and then when does Amazing Race come into the mix? That was about a year after. So how did they even find you? I mean, you were a big deal on YouTube, so, or did you apply, or how did that work? It was like through um, a YouTuber named Kat Riffick. She was really close with I Justine, and they got approached to do it, and then Justine didn't want to do it. Okay. And so uh, the next season that they were doing it, the casting reached out to my friend Kat and was like, do you know two guys who'd be down to do it? And so she reached out to me and was like, hey, would you ever want to do The Amazing Race? The casting's looking for two male YouTubers. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah. And so I met with um, my friend Luke, but they didn't like our dynamic together, so they asked me to find someone else, and that's how I... At least they didn't pick Luke. I know. They could have said, okay, Luke, why don't you pick someone Joey's not right. working out so I know. much. I felt so bad for him, too. Um, it was a kind of like a strain on our relationship, too. <laughs> yeah, of course. Like, I'm going to move forward with this. Yeah. Sorry. What about me? And so that's when I asked Megan to do it with me, mm -hmm. and so we went on the race together, and then the next year we did the All-Star season as well. So what was that like? I, I read that you couldn't have your phone. So as a guy no. who makes his career on camera yeah. and on social media, yeah. how hard was it to walk away from your phone? Um, at first, it was really difficult. I'd get like those phantom rings where I'd like, be like, where's my phone? Where is it? It's like the amputee who, you know, the guy who loses his leg in the war yeah. and kind of feels for his leg. Exactly. And it's not there. Um, but I pre-recorded a bunch of stuff and then I had my friends take over my social media. So no one knew that I was actually gone. Oh, okay. And then... Um, Actually, being on the show and not having your phone was like incredible. How long did they take for? A month. So you had content for a month. You could you just post regularly, mm -hmm. social media posts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, was that is that awkward going next Wednesday? I want you to tweet Happy Monday, guys. <laughs> or like, how do you do it? I didn't. I didn't plan any of the tweets. I just let them take full control. But the oh, okay. videos I recorded, like a bunch of videos to be posted. So when did you first get recognized? Not by adults, but when did you first? I mean, how. What was the first moment you were at a store or a restaurant and somebody goes, Joey? There was a moment. I mean, the first time that ever happened was at VidCon, but that's like a place. But yeah, you're supposed to get, yeah. So outside of that, I mean, I don't remember the exact first date, but a crazy one was just being like recognized in my car, like on a highway. No way. Like that was just so weird. It's like someone like literally rolling down the window and like screaming and like scaring the crap out of me <laughs> and just like waving at me with their phone, like recording. It yeah. was like so weird. Nice. So, so after that, you started your own web series, Storytellers, right? Yeah. But the interesting thing to me is you raised 100 grand on Kickstarter, did yep. it yourself. Where did that desire to create long form, kind of yeah. big content come from? Because YouTubers were, they were investing more money in like larger productions at the time, but that was for one video. Right. You know, it wasn't for a big series. Was anybody yeah. doing anything? No like one that? was doing that. I think I was like one of the first to just create like a web series like just like self-funded through like as a youtuber yeah um so where how did the idea even come about i was driving in the car talking to my sister and i was like oh my god i miss are you afraid of the dark like that was such a good show in the 90s and i was like she's like you should you should do something like that and i was like you know what i should yeah and so i just came up with this concept of these six teenagers sitting around a campfire but instead of like the story that they're telling is like different actors it's a story that has those same actors sitting around the campfire in an alternate universe. So what they're telling is coming true um, in this You've world that this they're making. You've got this dystopian up. kind of thing about you. Yeah, I love fantasy. I love sci-fi. I read it came from kind of you know what you read as a kid. What did you read as a kid? I wasn't much of a reader, I don't know. but I was big into like the labyrinth and like anime, like Princess My Neighbor Bride. Totoro, um, just like. Weird things like that. Okay. 
So how how did you start it on Kickstarter? Like, was Kickstarter a thing? Who you know? What, it just started. What so young YouTuber is like, like, I'm gonna raise a hundred grand on Kickstarter. Now it's a thing. Yeah. But then, like, would no? It, it was just like emerging and like seeing like that this was like a place for people to quickly get money. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh my god, I, I I feel like I have one chance at this. Like, yeah. you can only ask people for money one time, so I want to do it right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I ended up raising 150000 Oh, wow. Um, because originally, like, with Kickstarter, I think it's still like that, but people can pledge money they don't have. Mm-hmm. So when it came down to it, I only got 80000 out of the 120 I think, that was pledged. That's bullshit. Why would you do that? If I, I don't have $20, know, I'm not going to pledge 20 I know. It's, it's really frustrating. And so then after that happened, I was like, I have to do an Indiegogo. So I raised... Another fifty thousand on Indiegogo. Okay, and was did you have like a budget show. set and everything? I mean, did you have? Yeah, and you did this all yourself. I had a producer and a okay. director. Michael Gallagher was the director. Okay, um, and Michael Wormser was the producer, and it was. I literally am still shocked that I made this happen because it was. I was like a child yeah. making this happen, um, and then as far as like making a season two, that's when things got real annoying. What do you mean? I wanted to make it bigger and better, and I could have self-funded it again, like by raising money. But I wanted to make it bigger, so I went to, I took meetings, I got into a deal with Legendary, and it just took so long. And then that group that was at Legendary ended up leaving the company, and so then I had to get the rights back. And then by that point, it was like four years later. Too late. You lost the audience. I mean, the audience is still there. I think they still want it. Mm-hmm. It's just Escape the Night kind of took over my priorities, and I don't know. Did it? Did it make the money back? The first season? It did because they did a tour. Oh, okay. What was the tour like? Um, it was. I went to six cities around the U.S. and okay. I, I did a. Um, I just aired the whole show okay. at a movie theater. Okay. And I sold merch, and I. Yeah. And you did all that yourself? Me and my friend. Like, she planned the whole tour for me. Like, you're literally, hey, it's 20 bucks for a shirt. I've got change. Yeah. <laughs> my sister came on with me. Like, it was literally just, like, a pop-up. Like, Would you book the theater, too? Yeah. Just called it up. Would be like, hey, like, I'm going to be traveling here. Um, I'm very impressed. Where did that drive or the hustle come from? I think it's just my stepdad always taught me that anything is possible. Okay. And I never put limitations on myself. And okay. still, to this day, I think, like, I can do anything. Sure. And so, but not everybody can do that. A lot of people, um, Tana. No offense, we talked about. I think Tana would have a trouble putting that together herself when she was younger, right? I think a lot of YouTubers would have trouble. Okay, shit. How do I book the theater? How yeah. much is it? Am, am I getting a good deal? Well, I think. How do I print up the shirts? It's also just like finding those people around you that can help in those situations where you're not the strongest in that area. Okay. So it's fine. Did you have a team? And it was just me and my friend. That's so crazy. And so, I mean, she helped me a lot with that tour, setting that up. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just having those people that know their shit in that area mm-hmm. that, that can help you accomplish what you want. Did you really, I mean, that's got to be, make you feel really good that, okay, it's cool to have somebody comment or get good engagement on YouTube, but it's another thing to be able to have them say, here, Joey, here's 10 bucks. I really want to see what you're up to. Yeah. I mean, how good did that feel to be able to raise it? Did you look at your audience different? Yeah, it was really cool. It felt like I had like people who loved and supported me and wanted and believed in me. Mm-hmm. So that was really great. I mean, actually dealing with the Kickstarter was a whole nother thing. What do you mean? Because what did you pro- you have to promise something, right? Yeah. Like, what did you give them? I mean, it was like posters, shout outs, like pictures, <laughs> like all these things that <laughs> add up really quickly. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly you have like 20,000 people that you have to give all these things to. And it's like cameo before cameo. Yeah. Right? It takes so long. Yeah. And it took me like a year to finally like send out all the prizes and stuff. Oh, it's like geez. a really complicated process. So you're you're still vlogging at the time. Yeah. You've got this going on. Couldn't get season two done. What's the next move? Um, so in that era, it was just like, yeah, the daily vlogging. And then I moved into music videos. Um and then it's also just Were like, you doing your own music music at the time? I was doing covers. Okay. Yeah. And then I was also dealing with my sexuality and okay. like coming to terms with being gay. Oh, you, it, it took you that long? Yeah, I didn't come out till I was 20, 20 to my friends. That, okay, I read but 2015. Online, 
Yeah, is when online you... 2015 is when I came out. Okay. Publicly through a music video. Do you think it was... It's, it's, so it's 2019 now. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's only four years. I know. But do you think a lot has changed? Absolutely. Since then? Or do you think people are yeah. more accepting now than they were in 2015? A thousand percent. Which, what changed? I honestly think it was this like wave of just coming out videos that mm-hmm. just really made it totally socially acceptable of like when someone came out to see the response of all the love and support that that came with inspired other people to come out and all that love and support just created a safe space that now it's just way more accepted. Of course, it's not at the full extent that it could be, but it's world better than when I was a kid. Yeah. What was the reaction? Did you come Did you come out to your family at the same time or did you come out? I came out to them before my audience. Okay. Yeah. How, what was that experience like? Because I'm sure you have a lot of yeah. you know, kids who are struggling with sexuality. I, um, I was terrified, especially... Specifically my dad, because he was always the one who was, like, pushing me to be, like, that straight masculine son. But you said he kind of, when he saw his son on stage, was that, like, a hit? Or no, no? did he, did I he see? I was still scared of him, like, he's still... No, but he didn't have an idea, you know, he's hanging out with girls, he's in the theater, you know? I mean, I'm, I haven't really talked to him about, like, if he... If had, he knew? Yeah. Okay. But when I did come out, he was, like, he didn't, like, bat an eyelash. He was just very, like... I love and support you. And oh, that's it was great. such a great moment that I had like so much anxiety over. Oh, wow. How was your mom? Fine. Fine. Yeah. No, yeah, brothers and sisters, you know, everybody good. Everyone was fine. See, yeah. is that what message do you have for your fans out there? Is it is it more of a big deal in your head yeah. than it actually is? I think so. I mean, of course, there's some instances where the family won't react that way. But also, in my experience, most of the time, like, they just need time to kind of, like, like I don't know, go through the process themselves mm-hmm. and decompress from that, and then they come around. But um, for the most part, it is just you building this up in your head that it's much worse than mm-hmm. it is. So what advice do you have for kids kind of dealing with it? I mean, my advice is always just, like, do it at your own time. Don't feel pressured to do it at any point. Um, and I think... Finding support system, whether it be in person or online, that you feel like you have a, a community that could support you. If you do come out to your family and they're not accepting, you always have those people to like rely on. And social media has been so instrumental in that because if you're stuck in Ohio in a religious family yeah. and you don't even know any gay people, I mean, you really feel like you're on an island. Yep. But you can just pick up your phone and feel connected and tweet yep. or you know make a YouTube video totally. and immediately kind of get support, which has got to be pretty satisfying, you know, or almost like a relief that, hey, there's other people out there. They might not be in my little town yeah. that I know of, mm-hmm. but there's people out there who've done the same thing, dealt with the For same sure. thing I did. I never felt like I had, like, people that I could connect with in my high school. Um, and then coming across people online, it was like, oh, my God, like, these are the people that I wish I had in my high school. These are my people. Yeah, literally. So, I mean... When I was in college, like, I had no friends. I was such a loner. Um, and that's when I really spent all my time online connecting with online friends. Mm-hmm. So you've got all this going on, and then you start your Children of Eden books. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, you're smiling as you remember oh, that, right? yeah. So is that when you started writing, or were you writing this whole time with skits and stuff? Um, that's when I started well, I actually started with my first book, which was In Real Life, which was a memoir, which is oh, how I came out. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was just a story of my life and all the, the struggles I went through because I have a big teen audience that I wanted to kind of share my whole experience, specifically then, mm-hmm. while I had this audience, to talk about something that they could easily relate to. Oh, okay. Um, and so then, yeah, the Children of Eden series was the first time that I really got to explore like a fictional world Mm -hmm. building aside from like storytellers and stuff this was like I had endless amounts of possibilities because there's no budget when you're writing a book it's your imagination can go as far as it wants so that was just like so creatively freeing and it's like uh, one of the proudest things I I have do you second guess yourself yeah I did a lot especially in the third book of the series Mm -hmm. I found myself second guessing myself a lot what would you second guess yourself about how things end, how characters die, yeah. and stuff like that? I mean, it's also just the connections. Like, I, I think I put myself like the standard of like, I have this has to be as good as like J.K. Rowling. Like, how she connected all the Harry Potter books together, like, still baffles my mind. Of like, 
she she knew like from the beginning how these things were going to connect to like a book seven that like yeah how how, how the heck I, I don't know I would ask her the same question how the fuck do you do that. But I would, I'm asking you the same question. How do you, did you know in the first book that, okay, this character is going to die this way no. in the third book? No. It just kind of came up yeah. as you're writing? Exactly. And then things connected naturally and like kind of weirdly, but I didn't know what the third book was going to be when I started. Okay. And they were all New York Times bestsellers or were they? Yeah. That's incredible. And you did a fourth too. The fourth right? was the... In real life, that was my first one. So there's four books total. Okay. But the Children of Eden series is three books. Oh, okay. Yeah, In Real Life is about me. Oh, I got you. So was it the third one that didn't make the... Which one didn't make the New York Times bestseller? Oh, okay. Because... I knew my homework, Joey. Yeah. I know that one didn't. Of course, I want to bring that one up. Yeah, no, it was Rebels of Eden, which is the third of the series. Okay. But that's because it became a series category. Oh. And what that, does that mean? That means it's like literally in competition with like every single Harry Potter book oh. that has been on the list for 200 weeks. I got gotcha. you. So there's like, it's almost impossible to get into that series category because of, of Harry there's so Potter. so many young adult taking, series too. Yeah, like those books that have never left the list yeah. are still there. Yep. So for you to break into there, it's it has to be like turned into a movie for it to like really garner that huge of an audience to break in. And now you also had a health issue too at the time so you couldn't make, do as much promo True. F- for one of the books right True. explain so what was going on what's it what's it called thrash it so basically my mouth would break out into these canker sores that would lead inside to, yeah that would lead to thrush growing on it which is basically just like candida um what's candida okay know. yeah so maybe that doesn't i don't know thrush or anything. candida <laughs> yeah. um it's it's essentially like a yeast infection in your mouth yeah Ooh. okay so not that cute. Yeah, um, but it, I would expect you getting that in a different way it, yeah. without trying to insult your young fans right. out there, right? Yeah, exactly. That's Were usually. you up to shenanigans, Joey? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just so there's candida. Candida is like naturally in every single person, but okay. if you have like your immune system suppressed, the candida can overgrow. And so what was happening is with these canker sores, the candida would just basically go into these sores and and feed and. And grow to become something where it would just infect my mouth. So it would make it so I couldn't talk, I couldn't eat. And oh, so how big do these canker sores get? I mean, it's just like a bunch of them. Oh shit. Yeah. And so it just it's real nasty. It takes over your whole life. And I had to cancel my tour, which is the majority of how you get these books sold mm-hmm. and onto the list. So that was, I think, also part of why it was not. On the list. So, wh- how do you treat that? Um, still figuring that out. I still have <laughs> well, like I don't see any No, it, it, it like happens like on. every like six months. Is it stress or what causes it? I think it, stress has to do with it, but it's also like your gut has so much effect on your body, mm-hmm. and my gut is just totally out of whack right now. I don't see a gut. I see a nice flat stomach. <laughs> well, it's You're just. just- it's like just the bacteria in your stomach. Like, it's so wild. There's this whole like new side of just health issues that I've like totally explored, but like how the gut is attached to literally every aspect of your overall body health. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm just still figuring that out. Did you have to kind of take a step back? Because, I mean, just kind of going through your schedule here, you know, you're daily vlogging and then you're doing series and you're doing production and you're doing books and you're doing all this stuff. Yeah. Escape the Night now. Mm-hmm. You're doing all this stuff. It take, it's got to take a toll on you because there's really yeah. no days off. Right. Ever. There's always something for your career that you have to do that day. Whether mm-hmm. it's a brand deal or shooting something or having to write this. Yeah, or, I mean, even just like regardless of those like special things like being on like social media as a 24-hour job like you have to be posting on twitter or instagram stories like even those are just exhausting yeah like let alone like the meeting you'll have or that stuff like that's kind of like the easier stuff but like having to like constantly be on is the most exhausting and aspect. you've been on for how many years 10 years <laughs> uh i've been doing it for Eight years? 12 oh 12 years right yeah. you've been on for 12 years yeah. Do you ever need a day off? Yeah, or, of course. Or, of course. Or, 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 I guess my question is, since you kind of had these health issues, 
did you have to reevaluate your work yeah. life balance? Yes, and absolutely. Kind of take it back a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, during those health times, I, I literally had three weeks off because I couldn't talk, I couldn't eat, I like literally just sat on a couch and just watched stuff. So like, watch kids, I had kids to, like, shows. Would you watch? Yeah, sometimes. Yes. Okay, I actually still do sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, just honestly everything. Yeah, everything that was available. Um, so. And then did that feel good to unplug at, on some level? Like, <sighs> did, were you still doing social media at the time? No, I, I deleted social media from my phone because it wow. was just, I knew that it was like really causing health issues. Yeah. So have you kept that going? Have you been pretty good with your work-life balance? I think so. I think it's just having people help me with those areas that I just can't always be on. Is Daniel a part of that too, yeah. helping out? When are you getting married? You're two two <laughs> know, crazy right? young guys. <laughs> we just had our five-year anniversary. That's a big deal. Last week, so. Congrats. Thank you. Nice. But again, I still feel like such a kid. So it's like, I'm not, in any space. You still got plenty of time. Yeah. No and rush. We're on the same page with that. Like, he also isn't ready for marriage, so. Okay. But does he help you kind of bring you back down? Like, Joe, you're going crazy. You work 18 hours a day. Come grab lunch with me. No. Come, no? No. Because he's, I see, I follow him on social media, too. He's going crazy, too. Yeah. So do you guys ever see, you just pass each other in the morning? <laughs> Usually, <what>? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's more on social media than me, actually. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah. I think you and other early people have a, had a huge advantage over right. kids now because when you started, it was really just for the love of the game. Yeah, we didn't get paid for it. There wasn't a career. There no. wasn't a YouTube camp, an influencer camp, which boggles my mind that they actually have now. These things. No yeah, they teach you photo editing and what? you know what days to post. and hey, No. Fuck yeah, we're in L.A., Joe. You don't think they have the shit? Of course they do. We'll insert picture here. I should here be a counselor of, there. Yeah. I need to be a camp counselor. Paul, your PR guy's nodding his head off camera. <laughs> yeah, of course they have these things. Oh my God. Why you should be an instructor or something. I'm going to start my own camp. <laughs> yeah, you should have your own oh camp. Oh my God, that's so cool. Yeah, but this is how kids look at it now. Like a career and, oh, my engagement sucked. I mean, they sound like... It's like it's going to be like a a job like or a yeah. career in like a it is college. A like a, they a have, major. They have a master's. Uh, my friend's... Um, daughter was looking at this. There's a master's program at USC. You can have a social media master's degree at USC, like a great school. Like, what's USC fucking around Why? with social media? First of all, you don't need to go to college for that stuff. You it can seems silly. Just do it yourself. You don't have to pay thousands of dollars. And it's funny. I looked at all the instructors. They're like in their 50s. What they the don't fuck know anything. What does a 50 year old know about Snapchat? Nothing. That's they, what I'm saying. They know how to get a check. That's what they know. Yeah. I wouldn't take his class. Oh my God. I take your wild. class, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess I have something to fall back on. <laughs> yeah, if this thing doesn't work yeah. out, you know, you could have Joey's boot camp. <laughs> so, influencer boot camp for yeah. the kids. What else are you promote? Um, I'm actually headed right after this. I'm going to check on some stuff for my escape room. I'm creating an Yeah, so you're room. obsessed with escape rooms, yeah. right? It seems like it seems very on brand and for I'm you. And I'm going to one tonight with Colleen and James Charles. Are you good at them? I am. Oh, no way. Yeah. So, I've never lost. Are you serious? I've always escaped, yeah. I've lost at every one I've ever done. I'm fucking horrible, Joey. Oh my God. Maybe I'm just slow. Yeah. Or I don't work well with others. <laughs> Maybe. It could be that, yeah. You've won every one you've every been to? Every single one, yeah. What's the hardest? Um, The hardest, there was one that I did at 60 Out that was... Where? 60 Out. What's that? It's this company that's an escape room company. Oh, okay. Um, they have tons they have like the best in LA okay um but they had one that was uh I think it was Da Vinci's Code or something and it was real hard okay almost didn't escape that one okay so what's your vision for your escape room? so my escape room you, know, you is, get so excited I can see the I know. passion this is I mean I'm obsessed with them I just I really want to create my own escape room company so this is kind of like my shot at like I don't know, testing that out. Okay. So my escape room is going to basically be a full-on experience of what season four of Escape the Night was. Oh, wow. So it's like a really engaging way for fans to feel like they're in Escape the Night. So smart. Yeah. So it's um it's going to be around for three weeks. It starts August 9th. Okay. And um, we'll just be Where is going it? for three weeks. Beverly Hills. Okay. Um, How do people get tickets? How do people find out about it? I don't know yet. <laughs> but we haven't gone on sale yet, so I don't know what the website's going to be. Okay, we'll, we'll insert here because we're yeah. not posting for like three weeks. So look right here for Go more here. information. 
That's a big investment. If it you're is. gonna do them yourself, because think about the rent in LA it's and, and so you have expensive. to have a staff and employees. I'm terrified. And... I don't know if it's gonna sell or like people are gonna wanna go. Don't use like... your own money. I am. You're gonna use your own money? Yes. I don't know. You get investors or something, right? Not in this quick timeline. Well, like I have to like invest my own money because it's like I wanna do it while the show's active yeah. and like I don't know. I respect your hustle from, and that was from early on till you did, you, you know, when you've kickstarted your own right. series to now. Who the fuck is renting their own, running their own escape room? I'll be the and first. Cap- and capitalizing first YouTuber. on an existing series that he developed. Yeah. You've got a built in fan base. Right. And then you got, of those, you get people in LA, and of those people will go to your escape room. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Thank you. I hope it does well because I really wanna, I'd love to make an escape room for each season. Good so. luck. Thank you. Crystals. Oh, yeah. Let's talk crystals. Okay. So my question, is Spencer's crystals better than your crystals? Oh. You should do a video. Oh, my God. I don't know if you want to do a collab with him. He seems like kind of— My personal crystals are gorgeous. Okay. Like, they're stunning.com. Like, (laughs) oh, my God. I have an altar in my closet that's just, like, a rainbow full of just— Oh, it just makes me so happy to look at. So why— what? What's the obsession with crystals? What is it about They're just crystals? so pretty. Mm-hmm. I mean, they give off energy and stuff, but honestly, I don't really care about that. It's just, I just want pretty crystals. Okay. There doesn't need to be any more than that. Yeah. I like pretty things. Yeah. I want to look at them. They're just so cool to look at. And I mean, they, they really do emit like good feelings for me. So it's like, when I do see them, it makes me happier. So it's like, yeah. And you have your own line too, Lone Wolf? Is it? Crystal Wolf. Crystal Wolf, I'm yeah. sorry, Crystal Wolf. Mm-hmm. Where can people buy those? Just crystalwolf.co. It okay. has a bunch of crystal jewelry as well as some new merch items that like hoodies and shirts. And is that stuff. where you can find all your merch? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's it. I got nothing else. You got anything else? I don't think so. I think we hit it all. I got all the promo stuff done. Make sure you subscribe. I've got L Mills, Bella Thorne, and Garrett Watts coming up next. So subscribe, uh-huh. turn on notifications. Thanks, guys. Bye.